Dr. Shannon Clark here. I am currently in Houston, Texas at the OB Shock Conference that's being put on by the Safe Partum Academy. I'll put a link in my caption. Um, given what I have been talking about the past few days on my platform, it's very timely that one of the first lectures we had today was on maternal sepsis. So if you are an institutional care provider or a labor delivery nurse, here are some key takeaways from that lecture. First, remember, any organ can be affected by sepsis. Septic shock occurs when you have a MAP that's persist persistently less than 65 despite fluid resuscitation and the patient needs pressors plus a serum lactate of greater than 2 millimoles per liter. So when you have a combination of those two, the maternal mortality rate is up to 40%. 40%. So recognition uh, and suspicion of anyone walking through the door who is pregnant who may have sepsis is key. Now this is a great slide that Dr. Luis Pacheco who gave this lecture um, presented and I'm just going to go through it briefly. So this kind of represents the pathophysiology of sepsis and uh, it starts with inflammation and this inflammation if left unmanaged is what leads to multi-system organ failure. So starting at the top here you have cytokines that cause endothelial injury. The endothelial injury leads to hypovolemia that's why fluid resuscitation when you suspect sepsis is key. It also leads to an increase in the release of nitric oxide which causes vasodilation and a low systemic vascular resistance. The next important key component is the effects of the cytokines on the macro circulation. So we know that when you have an inflammatory response and the cytokines are released, that the endothelial injury that is occurring in the vasculature also causes collagen injury of those vessels. And the collagen injury of those vessels releases tissue factor. And then the clotting cascade gets activated. Um, it first starts with tissue factor joining factor seven, and then it just kind of proceeds on from there. I won't go through with the whole clotting cascade, but ultimately DIC can occur with the release of fibrin. And then that fibrin that's released causes diffuse clotting via microthrombi. And all those microthrombi go to all the organs, and that's what contributes to the multi-system organ failure. That's because all those fibrin microthrombi cause hyperperfusion of those organs. Now over here is another key component of uh, what cytokines do in the inflammatory response with sepsis, sepsis. In sepsis, you can have on the cardiac, cardiovascular system, you can have both systolic and diastolic dysfunction. Good, a very important point. In acute diastolic dysfunction, the heart cannot expand during diastole, and third spacing can also occur in the heart, and that can also affect its ability to expand. So you have to consider that when you are resuscitating a patient suspected of having sepsis or having septic shock with fluids. Now, there are five key things to remember if you suspect sepsis in a patient. Let's talk about fluids. If you suspect sepsis and it's complicated by hypotension or suspected organ hyperperfusion, then you need to get early IV fluid administration within three hours at 30 milliliters per, per kilo or one to two liter bolus. If that one to two liter bolus does not work before you start dumping more fluids in the patient, you need to find out if they're fluid responsive or not. It's important that if you suspect sepsis that you use a balanced fluid like plasma light or lactated ringers. If you suspect cerebral edema though, then you may need to give them, give them normal saline. If that one to two liters doesn't work, again, before you start give, dumping a bunch of fluids on this patient and keep trying to give them bolus after bolus after bolus, you need to know that all that fluid can cause harm. There are potential harms of, an, of unnecessary fluid administration, and here are just a few. You need to start broad spectrum IV antibiotics. Ideally within one hour, one hour, that is key. And then finally, get those blood cultures before you start those antibiotics and send a serum lactate level. Now, the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine has an excellent consult series on sepsis. I suggest that anyone in obstetrical care find it and read it. Doing these few things is not just for people who do critical care. It's for anybody who might be taking care of a pregnant individual. So you don't have to be an expert in critical care medicine, but knowing these key initial steps will save a patient's life.